page. Grace and peace to you in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, our Comforter and Guide. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to this service of worship at the First Presbyterian Church in Mount Pleasant, Texas. I'm John Goldman, your liturgist this morning, and we want to welcome all of those who are worshiping with us, whether you are here in our beautiful sunlit sanctuary this morning, or whether you are watching via our Facebook page or our YouTube channel, and especially our visitors in whatever mode you may be uh, viewing us, whatever time, whatever place. We especially welcome you and invite you back to participate in our worship at every opportunity. This morning we will have communion, and if uh, you are someone who still feels a little bit skittish about coming up and taking communion through intention, be sure and get one of the uh, pre-made communion uh, cups that are in the uh, foyer, and you will be able to participate in communion at that time. We welcome back to our pulpit this morning, Reverend Steve Newton from Nacogdoches, who is certainly not a stranger to most of us. We appreciate uh, Steve and Sally coming to serve communion for us and all the other opportunities that he will have to be here to help us during this time of transition. Looking at some announcements of this morning, tomorrow is the meeting for the Presbyterian women. There are other meetings this week. Wednesday night is Bible study. And if you are involved in the Bible study, we will be looking at Mark 4, the fourth chapter of the book of Mark. And maybe we might get into a little bit of chapter 5, but probably not. So just be prepared to go into the parables found in Mark 4. Mindful Parenting, which is a new class that has started on Wednesday night for parents, grandparents, and actually anybody who wants just to be a really, really good person. Uh, Carrie Henry directs that, and it is a uh, wonderful meeting. I am told I'm over in the Bible study side, so uh, my grandparenting will just have to be unmindful for a while. I certainly want to take that. At seven. At seven. Well, no, excuse me. Then there you go. It is real good. Rock City, Rock Grandparents. Good. Okay. That's for y'all. Friday morning, the renewal group meets uh, at 10 o'clock. Birthdays this week include Jenny Zimmerman, who will have a birthday, and tomorrow is Cole Pruitt's birthday, Jenny's birthday is today, Anna Henry's birthday is on Tuesday, and Rosemary Evans's birthday is on Friday. The Pastor Nominating Committee, the PNC, will meet again on Tuesday, February the 15th, in the Fellowship Hall. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? for the benefit of the congregation here. And with no further announcements, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to Break Thou the Bread of Life.
please join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin. We will be doing responsibly. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, you servants of the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. The Lord is good. Sing praise to His name. For the, Lord is blessed. For the Lord has chosen us to be His own. We are His treasured possession. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, through all generations. Let us worship God.
having confessed as a community of faith, let us now confess our <coughs> sins personally and in silence. Hear the good news. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
I was so embarrassed I could hardly speak. He picked himself up and smiled at me and said, Thank you, young lady. That's the most excitement I've had in months. <laughs>
Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Our New Testament lesson this morning found in James, the second chapter, page 1267 in your pew Bible, way over on the right hand side. James 2, beginning in verse 14, continuing through verse 24. So what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, it is, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that. And shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. So you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not just faith alone. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I've been debating there whether or not to mention this. Uh, I think I will just to be careful. And, and that is when a preacher prays for a president, he's not making a political stance, he's just praying that the president has wisdom. Uh, uh, recently, I uh, prayed for Mr. Joe Biden. And the person came up to me, the good news to you, they said, uh, well, that was a good sermon, but you're too liberal for me. And, and, and I said, why am I too liberal? Well, you like Joe Biden. And I said, well, I didn't say if I liked him or not. I just prayed for him. So uh, but just because you hear, you know, I prayed for Biden, and I prayed for Trump, and I prayed for Obama, and I prayed for Bush, and I prayed for Clinton, and I prayed for Bush, and I prayed for Reagan. And I think that's as far as I go back in the <laughs> But uh, we are to pray for our president. So if I pray for our president later, don't think that I'm trying to make the pulpit political. Okay. That had never happened to me before, so I just, I just want to mention that, and I might get in trouble for it, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm aware, I know things have changed in, in Mount Pleasant over the years, but do y'all have a Cane's chicken yet? No. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> I'm glad uh, we've been invited to lunch elsewhere, so... Uh, but uh, Kane's Chicken was close by the church in, 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 uh, in Nacogdoches, and when Sally was the church secretary, and I was the pastor, and our favorite place to pick up a quick lunch was at Kane's Chicken. Uh, they offer on their menu their famous Caniac. All right? uh, it comes with six chicken strips, coleslaw, french toast, french fries, and Coke. It's enough to feed both of us for one meal. On one occasion, it was time to make the Cane's chicken run. So I drove over to Cane's and pulled into the drive-thru. And when it was my turn to order, someone came over the speaker and they said, would you like to try our taco salad? Well, I hate it when they do that. 
If I wanted a taco salad, I would order a taco salad. I said, I want a Caniac. And so uh, I didn't, I was very kind about it, I thought. And the person on the loudspeaker said, uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't think I heard you. And I wanted to say, well, you need to listen. It seems like you folks never listen. But I simply repeated myself, I want a Caniac. I'm sorry, what do you want? <laughs> you know, a Caniac. Big chicken meal, six chicken strips, special sauce, french fries, coleslaw, and Texas toast. And the voice said, I'm sorry, but we don't sell a Caniac. And I was wondering why a chicken place would take a Caniac off its menu and put a taco salad in its place when it occurred to me that I was not in the Cane's drive through I was in the Taco Bell drive through next door. <laughs> and so I sheepishly said, I'll take two taco salads. <laughs> it seems that sometimes we look for the right thing, the Caniac, but we do it in the wrong place. A man called the newspaper office and said, you didn't deliver my Sunday paper. Voice on the phone said, well, I'm sorry, but we usually wait until Sunday morning to the Sunday morning. <laughs> Well, what day is it? Well, it's Saturday. Oh, that explains why nobody was in church this morning. <laughs> he could not find what he was looking for. He was looking for it in the wrong place. Jesus' disciples, like many disciples today, are looking for good things, right things, in the wrong place. So let me set the scene for the day's text. John reports that Jesus had stirred up controversy in Jerusalem, and for whatever reason, simply maybe to let things cool down in Jerusalem, or to get away from the controversy, or to have a little time of R&R, &R, Jesus headed his band of disciples from, Gal from Jerusalem and Judea to Galilee. The scriptures say they passed through Samaria. Of course, for the average Jew, Samaria is the wrong place to order a Caniac. And I'm sure most of you know the history between the Jews and the Samaritans. It's not pretty. Uh, for a Jew to travel from Jerusalem to Galilee by way of Samaria, which was the direct route, would be kind of like driving, trying to go from Turkey to India by way of Syria and Iran. There may be a longer way to get there, but it's probably safer and more enjoyable to sell, sail around or fly around hostile territory. But this band of disciples had to go through Samaria, and the simple reason is that's the way Jesus wanted to travel, and they were going to follow Jesus. They had to go through Samaria. I'm confident you know the story. Jesus and his disciples come to the town of Sychar. It's a small town, and it is on the tourist map. Because outside of the town is a well that tradition says that Jacob dug. It may have even had a little plaque or sign beside it that said, This well was dug by our ancestor Jacob in order to water Laban's sheep. Well, the little band are all tired. They're hungry. So Jesus sits by the well and sends the disciples into town to look for the Cain's fried chicken house. At the noon hour... A woman comes to the well to draw cool, refreshing water, and Jesus asks her for a drink. But it's hard to imagine the shock that this woman is put into. All of her life, she's been put down by Jews. She's probably never heard a kind word from any Jew in her life. And when she was finally able to form a word, she said, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Most Jews think that if I touch their water, it will somehow be unclean or impure, that I'm going to put my Samaritan cooties in the water. Can you visualize Jesus smiling as he says, Dear woman, if you knew who it was that was addressing you at this moment, moment a woman, a Samaritan woman, you would be bold enough to ask me for water. For the water I give, is living water. But when you hear a response like that, you think the man sitting by the well has been sitting in the sun a little bit too long. But the woman responds, even if I ask you for water, which a woman would never ask, which a, a woman would, would never ask a man, um, you have nothing with which to draw. 
And who do you think you are saying you can give living water? Are you greater than Jacob, our ancestor, who, who, who dug this well? For the, yes, I am. <laughs> and I can give you water which will keep you from thirsting ever again. For the water I give becomes a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And you know the story. But this sets the, the, the theme or the context for the next scripture lesson from the Gospel according to John, chapter 4, 27 to 35. Hear the word. Just then his disciples returned, and were, uh, returned and were surprised to find Jesus talking to a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking to her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, Jesus says, is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say four months more than there will be the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look to the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Thus is the reading of God's holy word. Several months ago, I attended a pastor's conference and several years ago. I was at a pastor's conference in North Carolina. And the purpose of the conference was to learn something new and to enjoy a little spiritual refreshment. Well, I learned some new stuff, but my spirit was not refreshed. I guess I was looking for renewal in the wrong place. In 2008, the church I served in Nacogdoches applied and received a grant from the Lily Endowment. The endowment provides funds for a pastor to do whatever it is that will make their heart sing. And that is their work to the Lily Endowment, and we took them up on it. Uh, the grant came through. And the goal of the grant was to encourage pastors who have served in the church for a number of years to make a long-time commitment to the church they are serving. I guess it worked, for after responding to the church in Nacogdoches, I served the church for over 16 years and ended up retiring from that church. In the application for the grant, the church said that an extended trip to Scotland, followed by a time visiting churches that have a, an outstanding reputation for outreach, would make our pastor's heart sing. And of course, the churches we lined up to visit the deaf outstanding reputations and outreach just happened to stretch from Grand Canyon to Arches National Park to Bryce Canyon to Zion and finally on to Glacier National Park and there were other national parks that were in between that we visited. But what is most interesting about the grant is that the goal was accomplished, but it was accomplished in the most unexpected way. As with the story in John 4, Jesus was tired and he needed renewal, and he sat down by a well. His disciples went into town to purchase food, food which offers sustenance for the continued journey and continued ministry. While the disciples were in town, Jesus shares his life-giving presence to a depressed woman. If I had told you her whole story, which you probably know, you would have met a woman who was divorced five times. In other words, at least in that culture, she had been put out five times. Five times she had been rejected by a husband. As a woman, she had no right to divorce anybody. But her former husbands all put her out. And Jesus offers her life. Not only eternal, not only life, in the, but life in the here and now. Life with a purpose. In this exchange between the woman and Jesus at the well, the woman met the Savior. And Jesus admits that in this exchange, it was helpful for him, for in doing God's will, he was fed. When the disciples came back with the chicken strips, the coleslaw, and the fries, they offered them to Jesus, only to have Jesus reject the food. He said that he had something to eat. 
But Jesus does not need to eat, for he had found his purpose. He found his life sustained by doing God's will. I think, of course, he ate some of the groceries. He's human. He needed to eat. But he did not, was not what he chewed that gave life meaning and purpose. It was doing the will of God. I have food to eat that you know nothing about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. In 2008, I thoroughly enjoyed, <clears throat> Sally and I thoroughly enjoyed our 12th week sabbatical. It had been my dream for years to visit Scotland for an extended period of time. And one of the places I've always wanted to visit, or two places, was the Grand Canyon and Glacier National Park. On the sabbatical, I checked off two items from that old bucket list. Visiting Scotland, fly fishing in Montana. But as far as any renewal that took place, didn't work. Oh, don't get me wrong. I thoroughly enjoyed the trips, but uh, I did not find them spiritually renewing. Sally and I had the opportunity to attend several meetings. She might have thought it was boring. I thought it was interesting and a little boring. But we got to attend several meetings of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. But uh, there was no feeling of renewal. As part of the General Assembly, we were invited, given invitations, to attend the Queen's Garden Party at Holyrood Palace of all places. And so we drove, we had our tickets, we parked in the parking lot, and just as we entered the, the, the lawn, the gardens, uh, the band started playing My Country Tis of Thee, Sweet Land of Liberty, of Thee I Sing. But they were singing something about God saving the Queen. I don't know. They, got, they get the words wrong to it every time. <laughs> Scotland was beautiful, and I was inspired by the beauty and friendliness of its people. It was meaningful to preach in three different Scottish pulpits, but it was not what I would say renewing. We visited St. John's Cathedral, even went to church there, more early service than late service, a place where none other than John Knox used to preach. That, too, was not a, that meaningful or spiritually uplifting experience. We went fly fishing, glacier National Park. I didn't catch anything, but we were very glad we bought our fishing license for a very nice park ranger, a Texan, a graduate of Texas A&M University, <laughs> visited us while our flies were out repelling the fish from our, from our lines. I think I'm the only one who can fish in a world-class trout fishing river of Montana and not catch a thing. <laughs> when we drove home from Montana, we loaded the car and started the 1,500-mile drive from Glacier to Nacogdoches. I was getting a little depressed. I enjoyed the places we visited. We met many new friends. We enjoyed worship from the pew. That's always special for me rather than from the pulpit. But after this search for spiritual renewal, nothing was new. On our final night, we spent in a motel in Childress, Texas. We were up the next morning to complete the final leg of the trip. And somewhere between Childress, Texas and Wichita Falls, while Sally slept, it came to me. I understood what was wrong, and I was getting excited about getting back to Nacogdoches. I understood what it was that brings renewal, and to be honest, I knew the answer. I was simply didn't think about it, and I'm a pastor. I should have known better. And I pray that I can convince, convince at least one person in this sanctuary this morning what it is that brings renewal, what it is that brings life, what it is that gives meaning to our existence. As we look for renewal in the wrong places, I was looking for renewal in the wrong place. I was ordering a Caniac at Taco Bell. Do you know where I found renewal? Or maybe a better question is, do you know where I continue to find renewal? Let me give you a hint. It's right there in the scripture text for today. Jesus said, I have food to eat you know nothing about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. I've become like the preacher in Ecclesiastes. 
I look for fulfillment and pleasure. I look for fulfillment and accomplishments. I look for fulfillment in the entertainment world. I look for it in fame. But these were nothing more than chasing after the wind. The only way to find renewal is to do the will of God, to do God's work in the world. Whether it's an ordained ministry, or in your chosen vocation, or in your hobbies, your spare time, if you want renewal, if you want meaning, strength for the day, it comes in doing the will of God. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his address following the march from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery said, Last Sunday, more than 8,000 of us started a mighty walk from Selma, Alabama. We have walked on meandering highways and rested our bodies on rocky byways. Some of our faces are burned from the outpouring of the sweltering sun. We have some literally slept in the mud. We've been drenched by the rains. Our bodies are tired and our feet are sore. But today, I stand before you and think back over that great march. And I can say, as Sister Pollard said, a 70-year-old woman who lives in this community, who lived in this community during the bus boycott, one day, she was asked while walking from Selma to Montgomery if she wanted to ride. And when she said no, the person said, well, aren't you tired? And with her ungrammatically profund uh, ungrammatical profundity, she said, my feet is tired, but my soul is rested. And in a real sense this afternoon, I hope we can say our feet, our bodies are tired from doing God's will, but our souls are rested. That's where you find real renewal. It comes when you wear yourselves out doing God's will for God's glory. As our Lord Jesus said, my food, my renewal, is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. Will you please join me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the example of Jesus, who reminds us that it is in doing your will that we find fulfillment, we find renewal in our lives. We give you thanks for sustaining us with food and shelter and clothing. But most of all, we pray your spirit will sustain us, that we might do your will to your honor. This we pray in Jesus' name. Hopefully, uh, everyone in this room understands what it means to sit at the supper table, the place where families eat meals together, fellowship, prayer, and they have each other. And in the life of our Lord Jesus, there are several examples of Jesus at the supper table. In the home of a Pharisee, Jesus took his place at the table, and a woman with an 
alabaster jar filled with expensive ointment, fell at Jesus' feet and wept his, and the tears of uh, wet his feet as she dried them with her hair, and then she anointed his feet with ointment. And it was a beautiful picture of repentance and forgiveness. And it took place, of all places, at a supper table. Jesus sees that key that's up in that sycamore tree who, wanted, who was looking for Jesus. And Jesus marches right up to Zacchaeus and says, Come down, we're going to your supper table uh, for, for a meal. And it was there, at the supper table, that salvation came to Zacchaeus. And of course, it was at the supper table when Jesus shared his final teachings with his disciples and instituted the sacrament that is before us this morning. Today, our Lord invites us to the table to seek him. Of course, this is not a Presbyterian table. This is the Lord's table, and it's open to all who seek to come to Him. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus who said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Hear the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord as they are delivered by the Apostle Paul who wrote, I have received from the Lord that which I also deliver to you. At the same night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which has been broken for you. This do ye in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. And as our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, I take these elements of bread and wine, and set them apart from all common use to this holy use and mystery. And as our Lord Jesus gave thanks and blessed, let us now draw our hearts unto God and present to him our thanks and praise. The Lord be with you. And you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Almighty God, it is our joy and our duty to offer to you thanks and praise. For in Jesus Christ, you have come into the world to bring light into our darkness, forgiveness for our sin, and hope for our hopelessness. Therefore, we gather with the angels in heaven and we sing.
we also remember now in silence of others about whom we have special concern. Lord, we give thanks for the events in the world that promote peace. And we ask that the competitions that are going on at the Olympics will help bring people of the world together. Yet, as we pray for peace, we pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray that troops will be withdrawn and peace restored, and that peace come to other parts of the world. We pray for those whose houses provide inadequate protection from the cold. And in response to your love for all people, work in our hearts that our primary concern will not be for our own needs, but as your word teaches, we are to be concerned with the needs of others. We pray for those who are homeless, people stuffing newspaper under their tattered shirts in order to find an attempt to keep warm. Lord, we pray for our president, Mr. Joe Biden. We pray for senators, congressmen, justices, those who have been entrusted with office. Give them wisdom during these troubled times and give them the courage to do what is right and what is best <coughs> for all people. Lord, focus our attention on the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ as we experience him in this sacrament. For we pray in his name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the earth.
May this work now serve you, filled with your power and with your love. Thy honor and glory forever and ever. 